Hello, it's great to finally be bringing archives to your town. First, I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. In the spirit of reconciliation, New South Wales State Archives acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people today. Hello, Tweet Heads. It's fabulous to be with you at last, at least virtually. Thank you so much for joining us from wherever you are. A particular welcome to the staff from Richmond Tweed Regional Library and the people joining us at Mwilumba, Kingscliff and Tweed Head Libraries. This slide is about how we got here. One of the New South Wales State Archives strategies is to engage across the state through our regional network and touring exhibitions. Archives on tour is another way to focus on regional New South Wales. So we actually started taking around the 1828 census to various places such as Port Macquarie, Bathurst, Tuggera, Goulburn and Shell Harbour and then COVID hit and that disrupted many of the plans including archives in your town. So what are we basically talking about today? Well at the heart of every town are people and buildings and State Archives contains a lot of information about people and a lot of information about buildings, not just government buildings and we'll hope to demonstrate that today. And the archives does cover a huge range of subjects and perspectives. So we're bringing you information about what we hold about the people and building of Tweed Heads. We'll talk about a particular series of archives, how you can find them on the website and how to access the archives. There'll be time for you to share your memories and knowledge. And we have a lot of records and we've only picked a few but we do also have a web page for archives in your town and you can actually have a look at that and it will show more than just the sample pages from the files that we have up here today. So where have we been and where are we going? We've been to Tamworth, Dubbo, Broken Hill, today we're at Tweed Heads and in the future we'll be at Kiama and Wagga Wagga. And we've worked with the staff from Richmond Tweed Regional Library right from the beginning and Wendy wants to thank them for being so willing to be involved. They suggested some of the people and buildings and they provided a lot of the background information. We are taping the whole webinar for future use, but we won't use your questions or comments. We won't tape your questions or comments. So these are the series that we're actually looking today. School files, plans of public buildings, theatres and public halls, bankruptcy files, deceased estate files and probate packets. And they're just some aspects of what the New South Wales government actually did and how it was involved with people and with localities. So we'll start off with the school files. I just do want to mention the fact that the files may contain opinions and terms that reflect the ideas of the period in which they were created and they may not be considered appropriate to today. So they contain, for example, petitions for schools and generally the petitions always tell you the potential number of pupils and sometimes names. Information on teachers, leave requests, examinations, complaints about teachers, complaints about children, often school building plans and site plans, information on how the school worked and more importantly, how the school interacted with the community. Now, these are actually what are called the head office files. So they were kept at the Department of Education and they are very, very complete, which is good. Although the later files from 1940 onwards do not contain as much detailed information about teachers and they're also more official in tone. So 
in this file on Durham Bar School, we start with the application and there's actually an inspector's report talking about the establishment of the school, explaining where Durham Bar is. So it's on the Tweed River, talking about it being a, for, a farming community, good land and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, people listed in the local community who would promote the local school. Uh, we've got a list of how many students might, might be expected to attend. We've got a map of the school district and where the residents who have children might be living. A lot of correspondence about teachers. They almost feel a little bit like a personnel file when these things didn't exist. Um, here for this teacher, William Tashihi, we've actually got a list of his previous employment and comments to do with his promotions and things like that from 1896 back to 1889. We've got a list of families, number of children who were supposed to attend the school and why they weren't attending often due to the weather or being ill or one because they had a sore foot. Here from 1897, we have um, William Sheehy, resigning this time due to his charge of obscene language in the local billiard room and the inquiry that ensued. Correspondence to do with the school site. So talking in 1901 about dedicating two acres as a site for the public school. There's a copy of the portion plan, the crown plan, and there's the two acres that they're going to dedicate for this school. So the files are listed in our online schools and related records index. They're just called administrative files and they cover those years 1876 to 1939, 1940 to 1979. You can also pick them up through the catalogue so you can pre-order them for the reading room. Because of their varying size we don't offer them through the copy order service but it is something you'd need to come into the reading room to have a look at. And because there's so much material about teachers and other, other aspects of the school, they work really nicely in hand with the teachers' career cards and the teachers' roles. They work nicely with the school photographs and they also work together with our admission registers, punishment books and the other resources that we've got from some public schools in New South Wales. So only public schools. Um, but well worth a look if you're researching the history of a local community because so often the school is the community and the community is the school. Right, so the schools for Tweed's Heads. You've got Tweed Heads itself, 1876, Duran Bar that we just saw, 1892, Fingal Head, 1895, Tweed Heads South, 1958, and Tweed River High School, 1961. And there are, these files reflect the times they were created in, and there are similarities between all school files. So you'll see reflections of what's happening in the community for World War I, women having to resign if they marry, depressions, expanding and decreasing populations. But they also reflect their town. As Tweed Heads grows in population and area, so does the need for schools. You've got the difficulties and the advantages created by Tweed Head's location on the river showing up in a range of ways. The files differ in size, so some are 15 boxes of papers, others are only a couple of centimetres. The file for Tweed Head's public school is over half a metre of paper. So you're only going to see a very small quantity of papers from each of the schools, but we do have our website for Tweed Head's archives in your town and you'll see more pages on those. So let's have a look at some of the pages. So here we have the Point Danger public school file 
we've got the 1876 application for aid to establish a provisional school at the Point Danger pilot station. And we've got the names of the people who are applying and the names of their children and their ages to give an idea of who the school would be catering to. The teacher's name is Angus McGuinness and he's been in New South Wales for three months. And the inspector has said that he only has a, a tolerable understanding of geography. I guess if you've only been in the country for three months, you would not really know a lot about the country. And here we have the school in 1899 and a reference to how crowded it was. So the teacher's wife is having to teach in an enclosed veranda because the school was only, uh, has an average of 60. There were 72 present when the inspector visited and the enrolment is actually 89. In 1903, we have a turning point in the school's history and I guess in the, the town's history as well. And this is when the railway came to town and obviously carved up a lot of the school's play area, including the toilets. There were telegrams going backwards and forwards about the resumption and the school did end up losing the land. Depending upon where you lived, the nearest school was not necessarily the easiest one to get to. So here in 1906, some of the parents actually prefer their children to attend Tumble, Tumble Gum rather than Point Danger. And my apologies for my mispronunciations of local names. In 1907, while plans were underway for more accommodation at Point Danger, the residents of Tweed Heads were petitioning the education minister for a bigger school on a better site. And you have this lovely petition with the names and their professions of the townspeople. The decision to move the school was made. On the left in blue is the old site and red is the new site. And on the right is a plan of the new school and its grounds. Teachers move between schools and they could claim the travel expenses, which is what you've got on one side, but they also fell ill. And here is a certificate, doctor's certificate for the teacher who is ill with diphtheria in 1908. Mr. Charles Sams was the headmaster and he died in 1913. He had been at Tweed Heads Public School, both as a teacher and as the headmaster. The letters left to right are from a teacher notifying the local inspector, Mr. Henry, of the death of Mr. Sams. Mr. Henry recommending that Mrs. Sams be allowed to remain in the school residence for a number of weeks. And the Parents and Citizens Association requesting permission to place a memorial tablet in the school. And here we have reference to the 1917-18 swimming season and the visit by Ella Gormley. And Ella Gormley was featured in our exhibition, Blaze Working Women Public Leaders, which you can also see on our website. This report deals with the difficulties of secondary education in the broader Tweed River area. Tweed Heads Public School was also an intermediate high school with children traveling to and from Mwilumba for high school, overcrowding at Tweed's heads and an expanding population. Now we move on to Fingal Point. The school that eventually became known as Fingal Head started as a provisional school called Cave Point in 1895. It became a public school in 1897 and that required at least 25 students but it closed in 1899. This note is from an inspector's report on a proposed provisional school site in 1912 and a plan for the actual school itself. This is the proposed site. It also showed where people lived in relation to the site. Um, it's probably only those with children are going to be mentioned. 
Dingle Point opened as a provisional school in June 1913 and became a public school in 1914. In 1916, a variation to school hours was approved. The teacher was travelling by steamer from Tweed Head and therefore he was always late. I guess he had to, couldn't get there before the boat. The climate and the sea air is frequently mentioned in the Tweed Rivers school files. In all the schools, maintenance was required. Schools could also be closed for a variety of reasons. And these are two examples. So in the first one in 1933, 5th of April, there was heavy rain. The teacher came, but there was no school children's. And there's a reference to in fact that it was flood conditions. And the second one is the closure for, for school in 1936 for the funeral of a local resident, which all the pupils attended. The local show was another common reason to close a school for the day. Fingal Point School changed its name to Fingal Head School in 1962 to reduce confusion since it was in the town. But still an interesting problem that not many headmasters would have um, confronted, which is rutile mining sites being pegged out on the school grounds. Tweed Heads South Public School opened in 1958 and there had been a site acquired earlier. The site at South Tweed Heads was also intended as the location of a dedicated secondary school when needed. So you have this plan showing both potential high school and school. Tweed River High School started in 1961. The plan was for a school to accommodate 400 pupils. School files, well, they're listed on our website. So go, you can either, you can go through two ways, either through the online indexes, which is in the quick links, click on S for schools, go down to the schools index and schools and related records index, and then you can search for your school name. Alternatively, you can actually type in the school name into the search box on the main page of the website and the school files are known as administrative files. So now we're going to move on to plans of public buildings. And the colonial architect started in 1832 and continued throughout the 19th and 20th centuries till the end of the 20th century. So we hold plans from 1837 through to the 1970s, but these are of government buildings, but they could have many purposes, land board offices, schools, hospitals, jails, courthouses, pilot stations, lighthouses, and even post offices because post, postal services only became a federal responsibility in 1901. So again, Emily is going to take us for a behind the scenes look. So we have over 3,400 of these in our collection and 438 of them have been digitised and you can find the digitised copies in collection search. The plans are of all sorts of public buildings from all over New South Wales, so things like police stations, courthouses, jails, public schools, public buildings like lands offices, post offices, some of those big buildings that you might know in the city like the Registrar General's Office, the Colonial Secretary's Building and the Treasury Buildings are all included in these plans but there are some plans that are closed to public access if they're of a security building like a jail or a police station or a courthouse that is still operating as a jail police station or a courthouse for example so we do hold plans of Long Bay Jail and those plans are still closed to public access because Long Bay Jail still operates as a jail and some of those very old country police stations as another example where 
the police are still inhabiting the building, those ones would be closed. But there are a lot that are open to public access. Radio. So here is one of those slides, the Tweed Heads Pilot Station from the 14th of May 1923. And this is Boatman Tottle's Cottage. Now Tweed Heads has a long history as part of a river system used for both commerce and pleasure. And the pilot station operated from 1870. We have plans from 1917 to 1927 showing the size and range of buildings from the cottages for the boatmen, for housing, to the station's rockets. And here we have a plan of Flagstaff Hill when the pilot station was there. And this one is the 5th of September, 1927, showing the drainage, always important. So how do you find the plans of public buildings? Again, there's two ways going onto our website. The first is if you go into the main home page into the search box and just type in the series number, which is NRS-4335, and then put your town name in. Alternatively, you can go into the online indexes in the quick links box, click on A for architecture and design, and you can search through this index. One thing we should mention about the indexes is that in fact, through the index section, the online indexes, you can download your findings as a CSV file, an Excel file or a PDF, which could be useful for your further research. Now, some plans are digitized and available to view online, but not all of these plans are actually listed online. So you can ask, use the Ask an Archivist section on our website to ask us a question to see if we have plans of your area. And our next set of records are the theatres and public halls records, which again you may not have thought of as being here because they're not government buildings as such, but theatres and public halls had to be licensed and therefore they created paperwork. And the licensing and the regulations around them have to do with public safety, particularly fires, things like that. Theatres and public halls were owned by private individuals, businesses, religious organisations, community groups and councils. And they could be used for many purposes. And you'll see in these references to from the local police and the local fire brigade about the inspections they've done. And the theatres and public halls play a large part in recreation of any town. And the rise and fall of these buildings also chart changes in population and the way in which the broader world of recreation has changed. So, and now we're going to actually go behind the scenes again with Emily. Here today, what we've got is the file for the Capitol Theatre in Wagga. This file starts in 1929 when they were thinking about building theatre and it carries all the way up to 1966 when they were thinking of pulling it down to put a coals over the top of it. A proposal to build an A-grade theatre at Wagga. It's talking about the location of the site and why it's such a good site um, and also the plans for what they intended to build on the site. So they were looking at that stage at, to accommodate up to 1500 people um, and saying that the site faced Gurwood Street. The police have been asked to provide a report. They're inspecting public premises as well, so another evidence of other work that they did. Um, here we've got more of a fire inspection, looking at the different appliances and where they were. Here we go, we've got 
got blueprints of the heating arrangements. Then here we've got details about how often they could show pictures here. So every night from sun Monday to Saturday and a matinee twice a week um, and no other uses for the licensed premises in question. So it was just to be used for the movies really, this one. We've got some lovely letterheads going through. And one interesting thing that happens with these, that some of these theatres and public halls start off as individual halls or theatres that over time were taken over and became part of a chain that might be through one particular area. Here is the plan of the Capital Centre. The lounge seats and the dress circle seats. The boxes. And a stage. Some of these theatres would have been used for schools and other organisations as well. Sometimes public halls were actually used to house cl house classrooms as towns expanded, um, and so you can see some evidence of that. Um, here we've got a letter informing the authorities that the change the name was going to change from J.K. Capital Theatres to Hoyt's Country Theatres Proprietary Limited. So and the file continues onwards to 1965, 1966. And at that time, the theatre was closed down as it was sold in 1965 by Hoyts, which we can see here uh, was GJ Coles and they were going to build a supermarket at that location. So, these are just some of the pages we've digitised. And again, we've only digitised part of the hall, but this is for the Empire Dance Pavilion. So the adjoining Empire Picture Theatre and the Empire Jazz or Dance Pavilion in Tweed's Head, both started in the late 1920s, but each had separate licences and at times different licensees. And so therefore we actually have two files, one on each. The licensees were inventive, Mr. Cox inquired about allowing, allowing people to skate in the dance pavilion free of charge on Sundays, hoping to get around the, uh, the fact that you couldn't have public recreation on Sundays, but he would charge for the hire of skates instead rather than charging for people to enter the hall. And the answer was still no. The local police carried out inspections, usually annually, and so you, they're looking at what kind of fire things they have, whether or not there are curtains or draperies seen or decoration that could catch fire, uh, water supply. And the dance pavilion had a capacity of 400 people. Mr. Drury, the licensee in the 1950s, wanted to be able to swap between the restaurant and the dance hall lovely letterhead in that last shot too. By 1961, the Empire Dance Pavilion was no longer fit for purpose. It was described as old, dilapidated, and that the renewal of the license was not recommended by the local police sergeant. And this is the file for the Empire Theatre at Tweed Heads. And one of the first issues was obtaining permission for patrons to smoke. And on the right is the letter from the licensee, Mr. McLeod. On the left, the reply from the Chief Secretary's Department. And he actually cites, McLeod cites as the fact that in Coolangat at Queensland, uh, theatres are allowed to have people smoke. And he wants to extend that privilege to his patrons. And the Chief Secretary's comment is, this department is not concerned with what is permitted in Coolangatta, Queensland. And down at the bottom, you've got the local police reporting on how the smoking concession was going. This plan shows the connection between the theatre and the dance pavilion. In 1946, with the death of the then owner, Francis Scaling Lowe's, the licences were transferred to the leasees. 
1959, movies were shown six nights a week, but by 1961, the premises had not been used for nearly two years. A world away from the Empire Theatre in style is the Twin Towns Drive-In Theatre, which started development in 1969 with community concerns about traffic. The screen was installed in 1971 and movies were shown seven nights a week. So here we have the inspection for the Twin Towns Drive-In Theatre. The cinemagraph screen is made of fibro sheets. So where can you find the theatre and public halls files? Again, on our, um, there's a listing of them on our website. Type in the series number, which is NRS-15318, and a town name to actually see what we have for your local area. And all files in this series are in fact listed online. But as you could see from the size of the Capitol Theatre for Wagga, they are quite large, so none of the files are actually digita available digitally. So now we're going to move on to our bankruptcy files and also our insolvency files. Bankruptcy starts in 1888, insolvency before that. And basically bankruptcy is a state in which a person was unable, unable to pay their creditors and has to undergo a legal process that results in the liquidation of his or her estate. Basically, it's people who owe money who aren't able to pay for it. And it's a record of who they owe, but it's not only a record of who they owe, it's also a record of anyone who owes them money as well. And therefore the lists of the debtors and the creditors um, show the commercial connections in a town and also between towns and between Sydney and between the main cities. The bankrupt person normally has to answer a questionnaire on why they became bankrupt. And this can provide you a picture of what is happening in the town and beyond if you look at a series of bankruptcies through time. And it can also show you the types of businesses that were operating and also, you can search these by a style of, of uh, employment. So you can look for photographers, you can look for hairdressers and so on and so forth across the state. Insolvencies begin in the 1840s and they go through to the 1888. So now Emily, with another quick change of outfit, is going to show you what's in a bankruptcy file. So we hold quite a good collection of bankruptcy files. They cover from 1888 up to 1928. This particular file I've got in front of me is for a man called Elijah Alexander, who went bankrupt in Broken Hill in the 1890s. So the files contain a lot of repetitive material because at the base, it's really about how much money was owed by the bankrupt and how much money could they get back from their creditors and give their debtors. Okay, so usually there's a statement on the file to where the bankrupt gets a chance to explain what led up to their current unfortunate situation. So he says he was recently the licensee of the Freemasons Hotel at Broken Hill and he's the bankrupt. He filed a statement of his affairs with the registrar in Sydney and he goes through a list of creditors that owe him money. He says he was insolvent previously in 1881. He attributes his bankruptcy to sickness in the family and the drought in 1891-92 um, and the Broken Hill strikes by which his house was boycotted and also losses on a contract to provide food for free labourers on the mines during the strikes. Um, he had three partners and he, he and his partners lost £670 by a contract. 
due to a range of issues with the partnership, he took possession of the hotel in 1891. Um, he gave the company 1,036 pounds in cash and then proceeded to spend quite a bit of money on the hotel. Had to value all the furniture and effects in the hotel. He says he's been out of employment since the whole thing started. And we do remember too that in 1891, there was also a depression. So I'm sure that did not help matters at all. So here we've got a lot of creditors unsecured um, and the kinds of people who were creditors were brewers and merchants and wine merchants, tea merchants, chaff merchants. We've got debts to the estate. Some of these people, or possibly most of these people might be people who just owed the hotel money for drinking debts, perhaps. Uh, so there's quite a people working at the proprietary mine who all owed like one and two pounds, three pounds sometimes. Here we have a list of goods that were bought of Alex Marshall, the wholesale and family butcher in Broken Hill, prime beef. And looking through it, we notice that there's a lot of cooked beef, there's mutton, there's raw beef, mints, giving us an idea of what people ate when they went to the hotel in Broken Hill in the 1890s. So in this list from this wholesale and retail cash grocer, Huskisson and Co, we've also got food. So things like raisins and vinegar, uh, thyme, flour, rice, oatmeal, quarter of a tonne of sugar, would you believe? Sago, turmeric, allspice, currants. Lots of proofs of debt from various creditors and sorts of things. As we just saw, the invoices from and the letterheads from the creditors can be quite beautiful pieces of art in themselves. The names of everyone who's got a bankruptcy file in this period are listed in our online indexes and in our catalogue. So you can search for the name and the location of the person. Um, our bankruptcy files only go up to 1928 because after that is when the federal government took over responsibility for bankruptcy. If you're looking for files after that time period, you need to look into the National Archives of Australia's website. So here we have some examples from the Tweed Heads area. So this is the bankruptcy of William Helm, Helmood, who was a fireman and engine driver, but was actually out of work at the time of his bankruptcy. So he was asked 56 questions and these six answers summarise what has happened. So his wife was ill, had been treated by the doctor for two and a half years off and on. His income over the previous three years was £320 and his expenditure was £400. And here we have the list of the unsecured creditors. And you can see that in fact, it's more than one doctor. So as well as having the butcher and the baker and the store creeper, we've got Miss Freeman, the nurse for nursing attendance. We've got Dr. Goldsmith, I think, Dr. Gutteridge, but also Dr. Hopkins in Brisbane. So obviously they must have needed to go and see a specialist. And as I said, you've got the butchers, the bakers, we've got nurse Burrows as well. So yes, that must have been quite a serious illness. Now, the majority of the butchers are local. Uh, Tweed Heads, sorry, the majority of the businesses are local, Tweed Heads and Mwilba, and the total money owing was 76 pounds. So where can you find the bankruptcy files? Basically, they're listed on our website. Go into the online indexes through the quick links box and they go to B for bankruptcy. And then you'll find them separated out into bankruptcy and insolvency indexes. 
bankruptcy 1888 to 1929, insolvency 1842 to 1887. Alternatively, you can use the search box on the home page. You could type in a person's name, but you can also put in a town name. You could put in an occupation and all bankruptcy and insolvency files are listed in this index. And as you've seen, they are quite large files with a lot of repetitive information. And at the moment, no files are digitized. So now we're talking about the deceased estate files and in fact, some more minutia as Fiona has just mentioned. Um, these are not probate packets. We'll talk about probate packets in a minute. Deceased state files run from 1880 to 1958, and they have to do with the fact that the government charged um, a percentage of the value of the estate as stamp duty. So I guess that best way to think of them is death tax or death duties. And the files contain the valuation of the estate. Um, and it's the person's estate when they die. So it's, they give you very detailed information and fantastic land information, but the, you have to have owned the thing or the, the land when you die to, for it to show up in these records. So now we're going to go to another behind the scenes and Martin is going to show us deceased estates. Hi everyone, and welcome to this next installment of our archives behind the scenes videos from New South Wales State Archives. We're in cell 10, uh, the famous green cell, not only because it has a green floor and green shelves, but even green labels on all of the boxes that are in here as well. One of the highlights of the State Archives collection that are held in this cell are around 7,000 boxes of deceased estate files from the Stamp Duties Office. These are files that were created when death duty was payable in New South Wales. The series of files dates from 1880 through to the late 1950s, and they are a financial record of someone's estate when they died. So in order to establish how much death duty was payable on an estate, that estate had to be valued in some way. And in order to provide that value, you had to list out and enumerate all of someone's real estate, their personal belongings, and their other personal estate. And that's exactly what these deceased estate files are. They're a financial record, but a real treasure trove of information. Now you can access indexes to the deceased estate files on our website and also on the websites of our partners, Ancestry and Find My Past. So between those three websites and our website address is www.records.nsw.gov.au, you should be able to find an entry for anyone that you might be interested in, in the deceased estate files. Anyway, what sort of information do they show? Come a little bit closer and I'll show you an example of one of the files. So this is the file for John Henry Williams, who dies in Sydney in Randwick in 1945. His file typically comprises an overall value of his estate and then the paperwork to do with the administration of his estate and that whole process of enumerating the estate. So page upon page of details of this person's estate. What's really interesting about this example, and it's by no means an unusual example, is the wonderful listing of all of the personal estate that was contained when John Henry Williams died in 1945. So you'll see listings here of furniture, of cushions, of curtains, of glassware, and a value for each item. Because that's exactly what these files are, remember, is a financial record of someone's estate. So they're a wonderful source of information because they tell you how someone was living at the time of their death and what objects, what estate, what real estate, what personal estate they left when they died. Bye for now. And this is in fact the deceased estate of William McLean Scholes, who died in April 1919. There are deceased estate files for people from all works of life, men, women, all ages and all financial positions, but you did have to own something to have a deceased estate. And 
the probate packet, which we'll look at shortly, shows who inherits, whereas the deceased estate is more about the actual items in the estate. There is an overlap between the two series, but it's always worthwhile to actually look at both. So, for example, here for William Scholes, he enlisted in World War I in the Australian Imperial Forces. He served in World War I. He died and was buried in France. So you don't have to have died in New South Wales to have a deceased estate. The main criteria is that you have property or shares that are in New South Wales. So his affidavit was signed by the public trustee and his estate was worth 270 pounds. Now we're going to move on to the deceased estate file of Francis Scaling Lowe's, who we actually met earlier. He died in 1941, aged 74. He'd been an engineer and a captain in the steamer service between Tweed Heads and Mwilumba for many years. He had other business interests and was a well-known member of the community. His estate was worth over £11,000 including over £9,000 of real estate. And these two valuations certificates for real estate relate to Curtis Avenue and Mwilumba and also portions 52-53 in the parish of Terranurra. And you get, if there are improvements on the property, you get a description of those properties. So you've got a house, four rooms, iron roof, three bales, a dairy, cream room, sheds and clearing and fences on lots, portions 52 and 53, obviously being run as a dairy. And here we have two other references to his real estate and Tweed Street and Hill Street in Mwilumba. And again, you get that description. So the first one is in fact, the valuation of a brick theater, iron roof, brick two-story room iron, with iron roof, a fibro hall with iron room, roof, a covered entranceway, a brick shop with iron roof and another brick shop. And that was in Tweed Street. Now, Frank Lowe's actually owned the Empire Picture Theater and the Empire Dance Pavilion when he died, as well as a farm. And these valuations provide that window that Martin was talking about into what was actually in those businesses. So for, we get the number of cows, 12 milch, 13 dry calves, the horses, the plant equipment, a Massey Harris plough, a HP delivery, international delivery van. And we also get the theatre plant and equipment and the highest priced item seems to be the 600 pounds for the Gaumont British bioscopes with complete talkie equipment. So obviously the theatre equipment, the ability to play the films was one of the most expensive items he had to lay out for. Now further assets and liabilities were located after his estate was settled. So the amount of death duties payable was adjusted in 1944 and 1950 and the death duty paid was actually over 600 pounds. Another example is the deceased estate of Mary Casilar, a widow living in Tweed Heads who died in 1952, aged 91. One of her daughters signed the affidavit. Her estate was worth over 9,000 pounds, made up of a house in Boyd Street, Tweed Heads, and five interest bearing deposits, which were the bulk of the estate. So here's the valuation for the house in Boyd Street, where the board cottage, six rooms, iron roof, garage, wood and iron fernery, fowl shed and runs, two tanks and stands. And here we have her term deposits in the bank and the interest that they were getting, one and a half percent. The estate was divided amongst her six children, depending upon need, and included Julia Annette Casilar, providing a home for two other unmarried daughters. 
So where can you find deceased estate files? Again, go into our website, the online index in the quick link box under D for deceased estates. And you can then search the index. You can type in the person's name or a town name. Um, for the indexes after 1940, you will need to have a look at ancestry. Now you can to get the number for the deceased estate and you can order, order copies of the files for $37.90 each. Now we're having a look at probate packets, which again are another great way to have personal connections with our records. And the probates do include the will, but there are also probate packets for people who didn't, who died without a will and therefore have what are called letters of administration. These date back to 1817 and we hold them up to 1976 and part of 89. They can include a variety of different information um, including affidavits by the various executors and the people who are actually doing the paperwork for the probating of the estate. Uh, sometimes they include death certificates, generally more from the 1940s onwards. Um, if there's letters of administration, they often have to, they often include a lot of information about potential people who will inherit more so than if there was a will. Again, not everyone has a probate packet, depending upon the size, type and value of the assets. So now Colleen is going to take us behind the scenes to look at some probate packets. Hi, and welcome to the latest instalment of Behind the Scenes here at New South Wales State Archives. I'm down here in what we call stage five of our facility, which is where we store one of our most popular record series, the probate packets. Probate packets contain the last will and testament of the person who passed away, as well as other administrative documents around settling of the estate. And as you can see, we've got boxes and boxes of them. In fact, we hold probate from 1817 right up to 1976, as well as a bit of 1989. And the remaining packets are held by the New South Wales Supreme Court. So why are they called packets? Well, as you can see, the New South Wales Supreme Court used to store the documents in these envelopes. But they're pretty hard to get out sometimes. And in fact, I can't even get the records out of this one. So now that they're here at the archives, wherever possible, we try to move the records into these white archival envelopes. And they're much roomier and generally much better for the records. So what else can you find in a probate packet? Well, sometimes you can find birth and marriage certificates because people had to prove who they were in order to gain their inheritance, particularly women who may have married. And sometimes you find very unique artifacts in the probate packets. And one of my favorites I'm going to show you now. This is the last will and testament of Cecil Winch, who was a soldier who went off to World War I and unfortunately lost his life in Gallipoli. And he penned his will on the back of the family photo that he carried with him to war. And to me, it's just a poignant reminder of the death and grief that that generation suffered during a horrible time in our history. But don't just take my word for it. If you'd like to go looking for a probate packet for someone in your family, head over to our website, put their name in the search box on the home page, and don't forget to add the word death. If you have any trouble, have a look at the probate guide on our website under Research A to Z, or you're welcome to give us a call or drop us an email. Anyway, it's time for me to get back to work. And of course, the box I want is right up on the top shelf. It's lucky I'm not afraid of heights. See you next time. So the first one I want to bring up is the probate packet of Michael Guilfoyle, who died in 1884. We're going to look at two probate packets and they certainly range in variety. Now, Michael Guilfoyle came to New South Wales in 1849 and was a successful landscape gardener. But his family, he and his family were also pioneers in the sugarcane industry in the Tweed area at Cudgeon. Michael Guilfoyle died in 1884, aged 74, and he owned considerable real estate, six houses in inner city, an allotment at Coogee, 
over 100 acres on the Cordo River near Wollongong and nearly 1,000 acres at Cudgeon. His estate was worth £8,587. He's also well known to the residents of Double Bay with a street and a park named after him. A reminder that sometimes local histories are often shared with other areas. This is a very traditional will on very large sheets of paper. He left his wife Charlotte the house, effects and personal properties with trustees to raise money for Charlotte's wellbeing. But the real estate is split amongst his sons, one of whom William was the director of the Melbourne Botanic Gardens. William gets 325 acres on Cudgeon Brush, Tweed River. J another son, James, gets 120 acres and also a portion of 250 acres that Michael selected in Cudgeon Brush in 1870, along with some land in Wollongong. The daughters got money only, no land. So now I want to move on to Herbert Shepherdson, who died in 1931 at Concord West without actually making a will. Herbert was a boatman at the pilot station on the Tweed River from 1890 into the 1920s. He is described on his probate packet as a retired business boatman. And his estate demonstrates links between the Tweed Heads area and Queensland. His estate was worth £178, including land in Terranora Terrace, South Coulon, and bonds in Queensland Forest Limited. And one of the interesting things about this valuation is that you've actually got certificate of title information, volume 1636 and folio 160, which you could then follow up looking at the historic land records viewer on the New South Wales Lands Registry website. So deceased estate packets and probate packets are a really good way to get into land records as long as the deceased person owned the land at the time they died. Now, he died without leaving a will and we, the estate includes, sorry, the probate packet includes this statement by his wife, Lucy, saying that she had looked for a will and had never been told by her husband that she had, he had intended to make a will. And again, um, all of our files are now, that we hold are now listed online. And you can go into our website, into the search section, type the series number NRS-13660 and a person's name, or alternatively, you can type the person's name and the word death. And none of these files are digitized, but we do have a copy order service for these and you can order them from the website by clicking on the little shopping cart. Now, before we wrap up, I just want to remind you of the fact that accompanying each of these webinars is a web page for the town that we visited. So the archives in your town Tweed Head page is up and available for you to have a look at. It contains similar information to what we've given you this morning, but it also contains, contains sorry, more images from the files that we've looked at. So including um, the, the school files and so on. And you can actually flick through the pages of these files and see much more than we've shown you today.